So um, welcome everyone to the meeting of the Maryland Chamber of, uh, the, the Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce's Economic Development Committee, excuse me. Um, I am Brian Levine and uh, we have, a, let's do a couple more introductions actually. Anne and Joan, I see, I see Bill from our board joining. Mm -hmm. um, who is the phone number, the 202 phone number? Do you want to introduce yourself? Are you able to? This is Tony Parchment. Um, I run a company called Star Connectors. I have an IT services company. I'm also the co-chair of the Black Business Council in Montgomery County. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Hey, Bill, we, we've, we've done introductions. Do, can you introduce yourself as well? Absolutely. I Good morning, everybody. Bill Wishman, uh, Vice President, Regional Council of Kaiser Permanente. Thank you, Bill, for joining. So uh, again, this is the, the Montgomery County Brian, Chamber. Brian, we also, we also have Amy, I think, who just joined us, Amy Prentice. Amy, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Yes, good morning. Amy uh, Prentice, Associate Director of State Government Affairs. Terrific. Thanks, Brian. Go ahead. And someone I'm in contact with quite often um, in and out of the session. Um, uh, Amy and I both do government relations. So yeah, I'm Vice President of Government Affairs for the Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce. This is the Economic Development Committee. Um, welcome. Good morning. Um, just uh, Ann and Joan, our co-chairs, if, if I could just do a quick commercial for some upcoming meetings. So tomorrow we have our weekly meeting of the Legislative Affairs Committee. Um, it, it, this is a, during the session, a weekly meeting um, without much of a, an agenda, but tomorrow actually we have a special guest. It's council president, Gabe Albernos, Montgomery County Council. Um, he's the new council president. He's gonna talk about his priorities. So um, you may be interested in joining that meeting. And then on Tuesday next week on February 8th, we have uh, our other policy committee, our third one, our infrastructure and land use committee um, is going to be joined by uh, WMATA, GM and CEO, Paul Wiedefeld, who has also announced his retirement, but he will be joining us. He's not leaving until the summer. So it should be a good and candid uh, meeting. So we, we, we urge you to join if you're able. Um, but without further ado, let's just get into this meeting. I wanna introduce, uh, again, our co-chairs, Ann Kadimi and Joan McLaughlin um, to get to kick things off. Joan, can I just say a brief word and then you take the introduction and run with it? Is that okay? I, I just okay. wanna, um, Joan's gonna introduce our guests um, I just want to say again, welcome to to Matt and to to uh, Tiffany. It's so great to have you here. As a longtime student of bureaucracy, Matt, your your introduction, your discussion about the Department of Labor as the kitchen or as the closet or the you know the kitchen drawer is just beautiful. What a great metaphor! One of the most essential places in the house, and yet doesn't you know doesn't necessarily have the um, the kind of you know, clean functional lines and yet so critical to connecting all the dots. So um, I really appreciate your analogy and I'm really excited to hear about this. I think you'll find this this group, you know, very, very interested in what you do, very interested in workforce development, very interested in the regulatory interface with the state. And um, as an economic development committee, we are very focused on trying to bring good insight and um, knowledge to our members uh, around workforce, the changing economy, uh, and economic opportunity. So it's a real pleasure to have you here. I'm gonna turn it over to Joan for the introduction. Joan? Uh, thank you, Anne. And good morning, good morning again to everybody here, and especially to Commissioner uh, Haminiak and Tiffany Jones. Um, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, very good, very good. And as we've already noted, he's Maryland's Department of Labor's Commissioner of Labor and Industry. And he has daily oversight over the division that has a significant impact on Maryland businesses, employers, and employees. With the role of the labor and industry being to provide and provide for and protect a healthy, safe, and equitable workplace. The commissioner will provide a division-wide overview in addition to information about issues like emergency temporary standards, COVID-19 protocols, and update on legislative activity, among other things. So with that, I will kick it over to you, Matt. Awesome. And I've got a PowerPoint. It's, um, I'll attempt to share my screen and see if this works. Um, but I'm, hopefully this is um, informal. This is just a kind of a prompt to have in the background. 
at any point, if you have any questions or thoughts, just interrupt and it's not a problem. This is meant to be a, a back and forth. This is just kind of to give us a some direction here. Uh, so within the Department of Labor, there's a couple different divisions. There's labor and industry, which is sort of the, we're the enforcement wing of, of things. So generally, if you see us, it's probably meant something bad happened. Uh, we're not the ribbon cutting happy people. We're the uh, kind of like the referees of state government. Uh, workforce development, adult learning, uh, apprenticeship, that's part of the Department of Labor, but they're you, apprenticeship used to be one of ours and it got to be so big that we uh, set it aside and now it's part of a workforce development, adult learning training section. We go back and forth and have employees that share duties, but it's, uh, it's, that's run by Jim Rutkowski. Then there's a occupational professional licensing. Um, we have a little bit of overlap with them too. Horse racing, unemployment, financial regulation, and I'm not sure I'm forgetting somebody. Um, but within um, our unit, uh, we handle all of occupational safety and health. So MOSH, uh, and that was a pretty big topic the last year or two because of COVID, but um, I can, I'll give like a little, a little explanation of MOSH. So basically OSHA has primary authority over safety in the, in the workplace for the country. Uh, the original OSHA law allows for states that think they can do a as good or better job than the federal government to apply and become a state plan state. Maryland's one of those. We got our state plan in the mid seventies and have been running it ever since. So we basically run our own occupational safety and health with federal oversight. Our job is to be at least as effective as federal OSHA. So we have regulations that mirror theirs. We have some that are more stringent than federal OSHA, none that are less stringent, but some that are more stringent. We're not allowed to be less stringent. Um, our building codes unit, that came to us in 2018 from, uh, it was part of the uh, DHCD housing community development and they transferred it over because it really didn't fit. Housing and community development is more an economic development agency and not really a housing and code enforcement. So we acquired them in 2018. Uh, safety inspections. So that's inspections of uh, primarily elevators and boilers, but also amusement rides and railroads in Maryland. And then our employment standards and wage statutory wages. So employment standards is everything to do with wage and hour law, um, wage payment and collections, sick and safe leave, minimum wage enforcement, uh, work permits for minors, uh, and about 15 other laws, and it grows every year. Um, and then prevailing and living wage, which are the statutory wages. So um, state funded construction projects where you have to pay a prevailing wage, that's us. So we establish the rates uh, and then we collect all the data and enforce the wage rates. And that's a yearly survey. And if anybody is a uh, data nerd I would uh, and happens to do construction, I would love to give the prevailing wage talk one day, but that's most people will fall asleep if I give a prevailing wage talk because it's it's pretty dry stuff. but. The key takeaway from prevailing wage is we established the rates, unlike Davis Bacon, that are for multi years. Our wage, our wage rates are done on a yearly survey. It runs from September 1st to October 31st, and anybody that does work in a in a county can submit surveys, and then we just compile it. The average wage rate is set by less than five surveys, so we get a ton of surveys responded to. But because there's couple thousand job categories. By the time you take the number of jobs and multiply it by every county, there's thousands of rates to set. So most of the rates get set by very little data, which is still better than the Davis-Bacon rate. Davis-Bacon, I think their average is two. Uh, we're about five, but still we could use more participation. And then Maryland's living wage law, which uh, is less and less of a, a topic of conversation since the minimum wage is now, at least some of the minimum wages are higher than the Maryland living wage. So the, the living wage and minimum wage have kind of merged together as a topic. Uh, so back door in the, the bulk of the COVID time, um, we had uh, the, I guess it was last, early in the summer. So OSHA's law, and this is just from the news that everybody's probably seen the last couple of months, you probably know most of this already, so I'll just whip through it. Um, Originally, OSHA, to promulgate a regulation takes years. Uh, I think their average is like eight years. 
some things can't wait that long. So they have an emergency regulation authority where you can uh, promulgate something that's a grave danger and it's immediately upon publication in the federal register, it takes effect. And then we have 30 days to adopt it at the state level. Uh, the first emergency temporary standard back during the summer was just for healthcare. So, and it was very limited to only those jobs in healthcare where somebody has a reasonable expectation of running into somebody that's COVID positive. That one we adopted back in the summer, it lasts for six months, it expired in December. Uh, there are still parts of it that are still in effect for record keeping but that was the healthcare ETS. The second emergency temporary standard was the one that was all in the news and made it to the Supreme Court. That was uh, the vaccination or testing mandate. Uh, we were in the process of adopting it when the Supreme Court uh, ended it, so it never went into effect. Uh, a company is still free to uh, have their own vaccine mandate, but there's no federal regulation that mandates it. Uh, so that's that's probably the most anyone in the world has ever heard of the emergency temporary standard. Um, having it be national news was uh, kind of funny, but um, yeah, that would have been us at the Maryland Department of Labor that would have had to adopt that and enforce it. Uh, we also have a heat stress regulation that uh, back in 2020, uh, one of your delegates, Delegate Charcutian, got a bill through that uh, requires us to adopt our own heat stress regulation, and we have until this October to get it done. Um, we're in the process of writing it. It hasn't uh, had nothing to release yet, but we'll have it in, in place by October 1st. And federal OSHA has one that they're working on. It'll be years and years before that ever takes effect. So Maryland will be one of maybe five states that have a heat stress regulation. It doesn't mean that the states that don't have a heat stress regulation, you can just work people until they cook. Uh, there's a general duty to provide a safe and helpful workplace to your employees and that most heat stress citations that are out there and we issue them now too, are under the general duty clause not with the specific standard so uh, we're working on developing our own heat stress standard. And then uh, always a reminder yesterday was the day that your OSHA 300 logs needed to be posted. So from February 1st that's every year you got to post your OSHA 300 logs in your workplace so if anybody didn't post it. That's your reminder to post your OSHA 300 laws. Uh, before I hop to legislation, anybody have any questions about workplace safety or COVID related stuff? Okay, no problem. So uh, we're probably just about halfway through the introduction of bills for this year. Uh, the way the, the bills work, uh, something gets introduced, the legislative analysts reach out to all the different divisions that might have some comment on it, and we have to analyze the bills and say what the impact would be on our division and what the fiscal impact would be. Uh, so this is just a snapshot of the ones that we've had to comment on so far. There's, uh, I think we're up to 45 or so that we've had some impact on, but the ones that are the, the big ones, uh, SB1, HB145, that one is a prevailing wage stop work order authority. So right now, if you do a prevailing wage project, you have to pay your employees whatever the wage rate is for that classification that they're working on the construction site. If you don't pay your employees that rate, we have the authority to go to the procuring agency and stop them from paying you. So it's a pretty solid level of authority. This bill, SB1, would give the commissioner, my office, the authority to stop work on the entire job site if somebody's not getting paid. Uh, we weren't the ones that introduced this bill. We weren't behind it. We don't really think it's necessary because of all the enforcement we've done in the last 10 years, we've never had to go to court. Our authority is pretty firm already. Um, but if this goes through, then we would have the authority to stop work, not just stop payment. Uh, SB 34 is a residential elevator inspection law. Um, what's prompting that, there's uh, give or take 5,000 residential elevators in the state of Maryland. Um, and a lot of them have a gap in between the, the door and the sliding accordion door of the elevator. And it, it has happened that kids play hide and go seek in that little space. Um, you hear about it more with the beach houses in North Carolina, um, where kids are, you got a whole bunch of families, they're all playing hide and seek in this big giant house and it's a neat place to hide. And then the elevator moves and the kid gets killed. Uh, so that would be a bad thing. This inspection would require that gap to be filled with a, uh, there's a couple of different solutions, but that's what that's really aiming for, getting residential elevators to not have that hazard. 
SB 66 is, they call it the Give Me a Chance Act. That one would um, require that any uh, job uh, posting application or promotional opportunity not factor in uh, somebody's education level. So you couldn't have a GED requirement, high school diploma, college diploma, doctor, nothing. None of that would be allowed anymore under SB 66, except for if it's a requirement for an occupational professional license. Other than that, that bill would allow or disallow any uh, educational attainment as a prerequisite of a job. I don't know what the chances of that one going through are, but uh, based on our analysis, I think 73% of all job postings would be in violation of that law. Uh, because any job posting that includes your educational level would be in violation. So it, that one would have a, a lot bigger impact than most people realize. Uh, HB 258, um, as of yesterday, that one has been uh, tabled, but that was called the Right to Sit Act, which is, <coughs> sound, <coughs> sounds kind of funny, but it's it would require that all employers provide seating for jobs that can accommodate it. So, the Commissioner of Labor would have to set rules that would evaluate every workplace and see whether or not seating would be appropriate. And if not, you'd have to put it in. Um, <clears throat> the funny thing about that law, if you Google it and start doing some research, the right to sit goes back to the 1800s. Um, so Maryland had one um, in 1896. And we originally passed it, but it was only for female employees um, because at the time, um, most of our workplace protections, and for those who didn't hear me go through, this behind me is not a fake background. These are uh, old annual reports that go back to the 1800s. Every year from 1884 to 1945, and then they they stopped it during World War II, and then picked it back up in the early 60s. So that's what all those books are. In about that one there, the 1896 book, um, it has a whole thing about the right to sit and how it's hard to enforce and uh, so it's an idea that's been around a while, but um, it would be tough to enforce today, just as it was in the 1800s. But as of now, that one's been withdrawn. Um, SB 224, the hearing for that one was yesterday. It's a joint employer definition. It's a little tricky because in the labor and employment article, about half of the laws or the sub articles already have a joint employer definition as part of the employer definition. Uh, but it's not specifically in the wage payment and collection subtitle five. So this bill would add it to subtitle five. Uh, the original version was worded a little weirder and they amended it to clean it up, but it would just extend it to subtitle five. Subtitle five already had it uh, based on some court decisions. So if you go through your law book, it's in the notes that it's there, but it just wasn't in the, in the actual text. So this would correct that and clarify it. Uh, SB 259 would be a prevailing wage for service contracts. So right now, prevailing wage is only for construction projects, um, new construction or remodeling, anything that's a state-funded construction project. Uh, SB 259 would extend that prevailing wage to uh, service contracts of mechanical systems in a public work. So every existing school, every government building, any public work, you would have to pay a prevailing wage rate for service people with service contracts on anything in the job. So basically uh, your water, your HVAC, your elevator, you'd have to pay a, pay a prevailing wage for those. And that's a little, uh, it's a very wide ranging. That would probably take our prevailing wage unit from five employees to about 20 uh, because there's, mm. We're guessing anywhere from 20 to 30,000 service contracts out there that would uh, have to have prevailing wage. And right now we monitor maybe 900 prevailing wage projects. So we would go from 900 to about 20,000 uh, if that law passes. Uh, SB 420, that's a workforce development bill from Senator Rosapep. Um, it's actually a neat idea. I don't know how easy it'll be to actually do, but the concept is all your kids get uh, advertisements and mail and phone calls and emails from colleges uh, all throughout their junior and senior year. He thinks that apprenticeships and uh, job opportunities should have the same right to send kids um, and contact them. So it would enable 
or require the Department of Labor to share the uh, minor work permit information with employers uh, so that employers would be able to see kids that are working and have work permits and then try to talk them into going into apprenticeships and uh, and skipping college, which I'm not a salesman for college, but um, you can make a pretty good argument that it's maybe not the right thing for everybody. And um, there are plenty of non-college career paths where you can make six-figure jobs within only a couple of years. Elevator inspector, elevator mechanic is a great example we like to use. Uh, the average elevator mechanic is making, I think, hundred dollars to $120,000 a year. Um, it's a complicated business. There's a lot of things to understand and do, but um, you get paid while you learn and become a, a master and are making over a hundred grand a year. Uh, and it's pretty good living. So that's the work permit information sharing. The HB 431 is a restaurant focused fair scheduling law that would require restaurants to give employees advance notice of their shifts and have to have a minimum four hour shift. And uh, if you change the shift within a certain amount of time, you still have to pay them for a couple hours. It, there's a couple of states that already have it. It's if you've ever had a kid that worked at a restaurant or you worked at a restaurant, you kind of understand where that one's coming from. Um, 698 is a minimum wage increase for you guys in Montgomery County it really wouldn't matter because the state minimum wage is less than the Montgomery County minimum wage. But what it would do is as of now, our state minimum wage is on a step by step yearly increase to get to $15 an hour. This would stop the steps and just put it at 15 for large employers starting in uh, this July. So it, uh, it would accelerate the increases. And then a whole list of climate bills, 708, 552, 596, 528, 494, they're all climate related. Some of them have to do with uh, building codes. Some of them are a little more broad and just say that the state has to be uh, net zero by 2045. So greenhouse gas, net zero, um, the challenge is most of Maryland's already built. So um, it's one thing to address new construction with building codes, but give or take, based on the current stock of existing buildings, it would take us about 50 to 75 years to turn over that uh, building stock. So um, in order to, to really achieve any of these goals, you have to get at existing buildings. I think there's a Montgomery County bill also floating around that would allow Montgomery County to have their own existing building um, energy code law. That, and if you don't make your building energy efficient, uh, that Montgomery County bill and one of these also would allow the state or the county to impose massive fines. Uh, so there's a Green New Deal bill that passed in New York City, for example, that this is similar to. Uh, where if you don't increase your energy efficiency of your existing apartment building or or office building, the fine could be hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars a year. Um, so it's there's a lot of teeth in that one. But that's that's some of the climate bills. It's I'm not sure which of them has legs and which doesn't. There was one that came out yesterday afternoon that seems to be the one that most likely it's Senate bill. I think that's Senate bill 494. Um, and that's, it has all the targets, but doesn't have any of the specifics. So those tend to be the climate ones that tend to pass, um, heavy on goals, light on specifics. Uh, any questions about any of those while I got it up? I know I went through a lot of information there. Okay. Um, minimum wage increases as of now, um, the Maryland minimum wage, uh, went up on January 1st, 1250 for large employers. 1220 for small. Montgomery County, you're 51 or more employees. That's already at 15. This July, it gets a cost of living adjustment. We don't know what the cost of living adjustment will be yet because um, Montgomery County has to set that. And then we actually, so this is a quirky one. Um, this is the only one that I know of where the commissioner of labor has the authority to enforce county, or not just the authority, but is required to enforce the county law. So all of the laws the county enforces their own laws. With wage, uh, minimum wage, the commissioner of labor and our staff enforce the county minimum wages. So the county sets the rate, we actually enforce it and take the complaints. 
unlike the sick leave, Montgomery County has its own sick leave law. Montgomery County enforces their sick leave. We enforce our state sick leave, but for minimum wage, we're on the hook for both. So large employers, $15 an hour, uh, medium-sized employers, plus some healthcare and 501c3 that's, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but um, it's at $14 an hour now. It'll go up to $14.50, and then your small employers are $13.50. And then as of April 1st, Howard County is going to have their own separate minimum wage, uh, and theirs is going to grow towards $16 an hour, not $15 like everybody else, but uh, it'll be $14 an hour as of uh, April 1st for 15 or more employees, 1250 for the smaller employers. Uh, on top of that, we've got um, anybody that is under 18 could get paid 85% of the minimum wage. Uh, there's the tip minimum wage. All total, I think with the Howard County two additional wages, there's like 13 different minimum wages in the state of Maryland uh, between the different counties and all the exemptions and exceptions. There's a lot of different minimum wages. So if somebody says, what's the minimum wage in Maryland? There's not there is no quick answer to that. There's 13 right answers to that. Uh, labor law posters. Uh, this is also the time of year that everybody gets the uh, kind of scary solicitation letters from those companies that print the labor law posters. Those aren't something that we print. Um, they're private companies that want you to give them money to send you the all-in-one posters. Nothing wrong with the all-in-one posters, but that's not required. All of the posters that are on that all-in-one, you can download them and print them yourself off our website. Uh, so that's the link to the, the poster page on our website. Everything, that, um, everything that's out there is download and print for free. Uh, so there's no requirement that you, you pay. And we really don't have, not, that, not to note post them, you should post them. And we do issue most citations for not having the labor law or the most poster, uh, but we do not have poster cops that go door to door looking for your posters. Um, we'll only, we're kind of like vampires. You have to invite us in. There's gotta be a reason we're there. We just don't knock on your door and show up and say, hey, let's see what, do you have the right version of your poster? Um, and then the rest of my slide deck is Maryland Healthy Working Families Act related. So we get a lot of questions on Maryland Healthy Working Families Act, our state sick leave law. I'm wasn't planning on actually running through the whole thing unless anybody has specific questions. I can flip through it real quick. Um, but is there anybody that at this point has any questions? There's a, I see somebody in the chat. Um, Bill 1621 Montgomery County, BEPS seeks men's, the current benchmarking standards include developments 25. Yes. Yeah. So that is um, the building energy performance standards for Montgomery County. So that's, that is similar to at least one or two of the statewide bills. Um, but what it would do is require building performance standards for buildings of 25,000 square feet or more multifamily or commercial, not including parking garage space. So you're typically that's a large, what you would be considered a large building. I think I just got a spreadsheet about half an hour ago. There's almost 15,000 of those in the state of Maryland. So that, there's a lot of buildings that that would cover at the state level. I'm not sure. I didn't sort it to see how many are Montgomery County, but I would imagine like everything else, you have about a Montgomery County size percentage of that 14,000. Um, if I had to guess, I would, I bet you guys have 4,000 of the 15 are probably Montgomery County buildings. There's a lot of buildings that would fall under that. Um, the one thing about that uh, I don't know if that one's going to go through the, the thing that the committee, when they had the hearing, um, they were a little nervous about that level of fining authority. Um, so they got a lot of questions for the, the bill sponsors about how much the fines could be. And when they started talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars, you could tell the people in the committee started getting a little concerned that that might be too much authority to give to a county. Um, it's, it's not without precedent. It's Washington DC has a law like that. Um, New York City has a law like that. Um, I think when they were presenting it, the they were saying if you were at least attempt to, and I'm not sure how you can show that you're attempting to comply, but if you were attempting to comply, they wouldn't hit you with the big fines. But 
they want that big fine authority in order to motivate uh, somebody to make the upgrades. My background's in insulation. I used to run an insulation company before coming to the state. I've been here since 2017. And before that, I did uh, 25, 30 years in a family insulation business. So I've been in a lot of buildings and it would be the converting an existing 25,000 square foot building to be net zero. It's not impossible, but it might as it's about as close to impossible as it can get. There's not a practical way to make a building greenhouse gas neutral. Uh, that's mostly glass. So um, yeah, I'm not sure how that that would actually work in real life, but it's good to have goals, though, I guess. Um, anybody have any other questions about any of the other stuff we've covered? Because I can I can go for three hours and talk about sick and safe leave if you want, but um, I'll, I can, I'll give you, how about that? I'll, I'll go through the, the deck and kind of explain it. We do get a lot of questions. This bill's been out there. The law went into effect February 11th. The weird date is because it was originally vetoed and then there was a veto override. And so the way the veto override works is it, the law goes into effect 10 days after the override. So the original bill would have taken effect January 1st, 2018, but because it was a veto override, it's got a February 11th start date. Um, Maryland state law February, uh, and Montgomery County law are, are very similar. Uh, basically one hour for every 30 hours, the employee works paid leave. If you've got less than 15 employees, it's unpaid leave. Um, and then you have to tell the employees how much leave they have. The biggest thing is if you already have an existing leave policy, you don't have to modify it if the employee can take their leave for the stuff that's in our law. So I man the sick and safe leave answer uh, line. And even now we're, we're over, we're almost four years in on this law. And I still get two to five questions a day from people with uh, questions about the bill and the law and how it works. And Almost all of them are some version of the paid time off policy. And I thought I had to have a separate bank of sick leave and this isn't fair. And it's at least half the questions are that one particular. Uh, so my, I'm locked up. So I can, oh, there we go. Uh, so in Maryland, at least it's 15 or more employees and all your employees count. Uh, and it only actually counts for, in, in, in the days of teleworking, this comes up a lot now, um, it only covers your Maryland based or the people who are performing their work in Maryland. So if you work the majority of your time in Maryland, you're covered by our sick leave law. Uh, so if you've got a company that's based out of California, but you have one remote worker in Maryland, they're covered by the Maryland law. Uh, so we're getting a lot of questions from out of state employers these days. Uh, that's all the things that our sick leave can be used for. Basically, sickness, family member sickness, uh, physical or mental, maternity or paternity leave, and then absence due to domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking. That's the safe part of sick and safe leave. Um, sometimes it's easier to talk about who isn't covered than who is. So there's some exemptions. You have to be an employee. You have to work at least 12 hours a, a week. Um, and then there's an exemption for what they call PRNs, the pro re nada healthcare workers, the people that can accept or reject the shift and aren't guaranteed a, a, to called into work. Uh, the PRNs are exempt. Uh, the definition of family member like that, it's probably also easier to say who isn't a family member. Basically, uh, any immediate family member, grandchild to grandparent, step-grandparent, step-grandchild, somebody who acts like your parent in loco parentis, biological, adoptive, foster, everybody's included. Uh, the ones who aren't included, aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews, not included, and pets, not included. A lot of people think their pets are part of their family, but you don't get to take off and use your sick leave to take a dog to the vet. Um, interesting, not different topic, but I haven't seen it yet this year, but uh, there was a bereavement leave bill that was put in, I think two sessions ago, that would enable you to use your leave for if your pet dies. Um, and that they that would have been us that would have had to enforce that. The tricky part about that bill is it didn't define pet. Uh, so we would have had to establish a regulation to say what 
counts as a pet and what doesn't. So most of the time you think dogs, cats, uh, hamsters, but there is no definition. There is no accepted definition for what is or isn't a pet. Uh, so we would have had to somehow settle that argument. But during the hearings for the bill, what they realized was there actually isn't a bereavement leave law for humans. Um, so they, may, they meant it to be a pet bereavement leave, expanding the human bereavement leave, but there wasn't a human bereavement leave. So then the following year, which was last year, they put in a human bereavement leave law. So um, that little tangent on pets and family. But, um, you don't have to modify your existing leave policy if you can still use your leave. Um, so some employers, there's a lot of ways to, uh, to write a policy that is or acceptable. Uh, some employers take their sick leave and establish a separate bucket of leave for sick leave. Some employers separate it, but it's still part of the paid time off. So when you take sick leave, it deducts from both sick leave and paid time off. That's allowed. Uh, some employers just say you get two weeks of paid time off, use it forever you want. That's it's all in one. All of them are fine. Uh, you just have to meet the minimums of the law one hour for every 30 hours that they work up to 40 hours per year. Anything above that is fine with us. Um, and if you're a state or local government employee, you have to follow the rules of your agency. Uh, your pay rate is what you normally earn. Uh, and if you're a tipped employee, which I don't think we have any restaurant employers on the, on the thing, but you don't have to pay higher than minimum wage for your tipped employees. You don't have to pay them what they would have made in tips. Uh, carry over your leave at the end of the year, but you're not required to pay it out if the employee terminates. If the employee terminates, the only requirement is you give it back if they come back within 37 weeks. Uh, you can front load it or accrue it throughout the year. Either way works. If you front load it, you don't have to allow rollover. So that's kind of the incentive to front load instead of rollover. That's the rehire. Um, the employee has to provide advance notice if foreseeable. If it's not foreseeable, you just have to let the employer know as soon as practicable. Um, I think they put that in there just to make me try to say practicable as many times as possible. Um, pra practicable and rural are the two words that I have a very hard time with, but for whatever reason, luckily rural isn't in the sick leave bill, uh, the, but practicable is. And so uh, you have to provide that, those as soon as practicable. Yes? I think we have a question in the chat. Yes. All right. Let me see. For whatever reason, I'm not, there it is. If an employer has work in multiple states and posts their job on, for example, indeed, how would a building? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is, um, so the question is, if you are working in multiple states and you post your job on Indeed, how do you not violate Maryland's law? It would violate Maryland's law. And that's one of the, the challenges. We would have to receive a complaint about it. So we would know it's out there, but one of the, that would be one of the bigger challenges. And it's per applicant, fine. So it's not a per job posting. The penalty is per applicant. Uh, so you could, you could get a lot of complaints um, for a company that's based in California or Minnesota that posts a job on Indeed and is allowing remote workers. A, a Maryland employer could, or a Maryland employee could file a complaint with us, and then we would have to attempt to enforce that against an out-of-state company. It would be, it would be a very difficult bill to enforce. Um, because of these kind of situations, you're going to have a lot of people that are going to be in violation of it and had no idea the law even existed in the first place. Um, what would end up happening, I think our fiscal note on the bill, we said we'd need, I think we asked for 15 employees. I think they said it would, we would get maybe eight or 10 new employees, which is almost doubling the size of our employment standards unit. Um, this could easily be thousands of complaints a year for a, a unit that gets give or take 1100 complaints uh, total, this could, this could be a lot of complaints uh, because it's relatively standard to have uh, education requirements in a job posting. And it would also be for interior promotions as well. So um, if you have a job that's internal promotion only, that could also be potentially violative of SB 66. 
Uh, do I also cover weights and measures? No. Uh, weights and measures is, I think, Department of Agriculture. Um, but thankfully, that's not us. Uh, that would be an interesting one, though. Um, what was the other? I think that was it. Okay. Um, any other questions as we had? Um, okay. So notice and verification. Um, denying leave. Basically, you can only deny leave if the em employee didn't have leave in the first place available. Uh, if they didn't provide advance notice and it would be causing a disruption to the employer um, or for certain healthcare employers, if you're responsible for taking care of a developmentally disabled or mentally ill person, you can deny the leave, but only under certain circumstances. Basically, you don't want to leave somebody who needs that care without care. Uh, so there's a little exemption for that. Uh, employees can trade shifts. Not that big a deal. Um, leave increments, smallest increment the payroll system allows, but can't be more than four hours. So you can't say you got to take a whole day at a time. Only four hours is the most you can do. You have to tell the employee what the balance is. Sounds like not that big a deal, but that took us, we had to work with the restaurant association and payroll service companies to try to get the pay stub uh, rules okayed. That took us like 18 months to get those rules set. Uh, that was a lot more trouble than everybody thought because it is not easy to reprogram your uh, pay stub in the computer system. Uh, there's a bill actually, well, it got tabled, but there was a bill that would have required pay stub changes this year. And it's so far it's been tabled, but it would, I think it has eight different things that pay stub would have to have, and it would go into effect this October. So let's hope that one doesn't go through because it, I never realized how difficult it was to reprogram a, a payroll software. Uh, you have to keep the records for three years, like all the other records. Uh, frequently asked questions. When does it start? Does it preempt local laws? This is yes, except for Montgomery County, because Montgomery County had theirs first. Um, but actually, Prince George's County had one, too. And Prince, George, Prince George's, their sick leave law got canceled, but Montgomery's didn't. Not sure how they, Montgomery County, I guess, has better legislators than Prince George's. Um, <laughs> does it apply to out-of-state employers? It does. Uh, does it apply to out-of-state employees? No, only employees who work in Maryland. Uh, and can employee have different anniversary dates? Yeah, so you don't have to have all your employees on the same calendar. You can set them at different, have it be your start date, your birthday, however you want to do it. it year is defined in the bill as a consecutive 365-day uh, time frame. It's not calendar year, fiscal year, company year. It's whatever way you want to do it. Um, and I have a couple frequently asked questions, which people actually, these are real frequently asked questions. This comes up all the time. I probably have gotten this one at least once a day, some version of this. My employer provides compensated leave. There's no differentiation between stick and vacation. We have to use the leave for both. Does this provide additional leave for sick and safe? No. Uh, but this is my favorite one. Uh, our company would like to establish a policy of 40 hours of upfront sick and safe leave per year and would like to upfront the following days, Memorial Day, Independence Day, Labor Day, Thanksgiving Day, and Christmas. Would this be acceptable? Somebody actually asked that. Um, the answer is no. Uh, sick leave, you're supposed to be able to take on your sick, not on holidays. But um, the funny thing was um, all those things aren't required by Maryland law. So if you wanted to be this employer, you could take away all your paid holidays and make a sick leave bucket out of that. Um, your employees will hate you, but that would be allowed. Um, uh, and then that one is same thing, paid time off question. Uh, can an organization opt out by prepaying an employee for the equivalent amount of five days of sick and save leave and not actually allow them to accrue and use it? Good question, and we I've gotten that one more than once, but no. Uh, you have to be able to use your sick leave for when you're sick, not get it up front. Um, this one, I don't think we have anybody that this would apply to, but if you have an employee that's scheduled to work part of a shift at one department at one wage rate and the same shift at a different department at a different wage rate, how do you pay them? 
Uh, so the way around this, you pay them their regular rate so you can establish a base rate of pay. Um, so take some sort of calculation to establish a regular rate and then that's the rate you pay the leave at. So in like a prevailing wage job, they might be getting $40 an hour on their prevailing wage job, but that's not the rate unless that's the regular rate. If they usually make 20 and the prevailing wage job's 40 and they take off, you don't have to pay them the 40, you pay them 20, whatever the regular rate is. How much, how long to retain records? Three years. And that's it. So that's all of my, um, I'm gonna stop sharing. That is everything I had um, slide deck wise. So what kind of questions does anybody have about anything we do? I can tell you stories about uh, amusement rides or, or horrible workplace accidents, if you'd like, or any questions you got. I have a standing rule. Don't show me the videos of, or pictures of horrible workplace accidents. We get a lot of those um, as part of the motion investigations. There's a lot of, a lot of grisly things. Um, but thankfully, I've, I've been spared most of those. Yes. Matt, I have a question. So sure. first of all, thank you. Incredible, incredible detail. A lot of a lot of knowledge about um, really important um, regulations that impact all of us every day and very helpful. Um, you know, through you, you point to those books behind you, the, the annual reports behind you and how important they are. And, you know, clearly there's a, a, a large amount of re regulations and and a regular regulatory process. I'm wondering if you could talk about how in your time, how that regulatory process has changed. You know, there's always a sense of, you know, the burden, the onus, the, you know, the lack of flexibility associated with regulation things, especially during COVID, you know, so much now going to so many virtual options and different things and using technology in different ways. How, how have you seen the process of making these regulations and um, implement, you know, kind of developing these regulations change over the years, at least in your time there? Um, do you have any observations around that? Is it more efficient? Is it more inclusive? Is it more flexible? We'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So the regulatory process, like the legal process, is slow and it's by design. So because um, most employers don't have somebody dedicated to sitting and watching the Maryland register and checking and see if there's any new stuff um, popping up. It's, it is by design hard to change a regulation. Uh, so in order to, to write a regulation, first of all, we have to have the authority. So not all laws give us the authority to uh, set regulations. So if there's a bill that gives us the authority or a law that gives us the authority, we can only clarify the law we can't expand a law we can't change the law we can only clarify it with the regulation so regulation is not lawmaking it's it's meant to help enforcement of the laws not change them uh, so if there is a law that allows us to write a regulation we go through a, a very open process we uh, usually if we have a, a board like the most advisory board or there's a boiler board or an elevator board we bring the regulations in front of them. So you have industry experts that are reviewing it and working with us in the design stage of the regulation. It then gets published in the Maryland Register, open for comment. We have to address every single comment that comes in. So we've got a regulation email box. People send us emails, people can call, people can come to the hearing. We address every, every comment about it. And then if it's um, like in the case of the the wage statement for the tipped employees, we had to go completely back to the drawing board and redo it because what we thought was clear and simple turned out wasn't clear and simple. Uh, if it is without objection, we repost it in the Maryland Register and then it becomes a regulation. So it's meant to be slow. It's meant to be deliberative. It's meant to get public comment and input from stakeholders. Uh, the only law that we have that allows us to do anything quick is the emergency temporary standard. And even that, you're only allowed to have it in place for six months because it's not supposed to be, um, you're not supposed to shortcut the process and it's not supposed to be easy. So by design, it's slow. One of the upsides of COVID time is like right now, we're on a webinar. So uh, it's a lot easier to get public input on things. So we can have our meetings when we were having meetings over the summer about our um, 
heat stress regulation that we're working on. We had a, a virtual option where people could could attend virtually and give comment like the legislature does. You can submit testimony, uh, and attend meetings over the web, which makes it a little easier because Maryland is, as everybody knows, it's not a big state, but it's a really wide state. So there's a lot of people who it is not convenient to come to a meeting in central Maryland uh, to give your public comment. This Zoom and, and webinar world has made it a lot easier to hear what people think on things. Um, so that part, I, I really enjoy. Um, so we get a lot more input now than we did before, just because we have um, the ability to do webinars and have people send us video messages and we'll take any comment any way it comes. Um, but so in that regard, we do get better comments and more information these days. Um, but that also makes it a little slower because we still have to uh, review and address it. I think our heat stress, it's, I got a book over there. It's, we got almost 400 pages uh, front and back of comments from people that we have to go through. So there's a lot of comments. A lot of it's the same ideas, but uh, it's meant to be slow. It's moved a little faster. We get more input, but by design, regulations are supposed to be hard. So you can have a law, a regulation can clarify the law. And then if you have an existing regulation, we can issue like a guidance document, frequently asked questions, things like that, but they can't change regulations or law. You can just clarify and try to be helpful, but you can't change it. If you're going to change a law, got to go through the legislature. If you're going to change a regulation, you got to have a very open and deliberative process. So it's meant to be slow and that's good. That's not a bad thing. Because uh, yeah, every regulation is some other burden that somebody has got to understand. And honestly, our, our philosophy is um, we're labor and industry. We're supposed to be in the middle. We're not on one side or the other. We're here to enforce the rules, not make them. So I don't have opinions on legislation. I mean, I have plenty of opinions, but by design, I'm not allowed to go and tell you what you should and shouldn't do with laws. I don't, we don't go and testify in front of committees and tell them, unless it's a departmental bill, we don't, we'll give them what's the impact, but we don't give them opinions. That's not our job. We're here to enforce. So I, if you just picture from here down a referee's outfit, we're supposed to be neutral in between not one side or the other, labor and industry, not labor or industry. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you. No problem. Other questions? Yeah, we're almost at the hour mark, so that's about what I- I have um, a question. Andrew, yeah. has a question. Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks for uh, joining us today and sharing all this critical information. Um, just a question around the um, Healthy Family Act, and especially SB 66, the no degrees. Um, of course, you know, I, I'm a, I have a business that operates around the Beltway, so it wouldn't necessarily apply to us. But for those California companies that you referred to, would it be just easier for them if they have a requirement for an uh, MBA with uh, four years or five years experience, et cetera, to just eliminate um, uh, Maryland from the Indeed search, and and so does is, does this run the risk of disenfranchising uh, Maryland employee potential employees? It could, and that's so. Like with the Healthy Working Families Act, there's a lot of states that have their own versions of sick leave laws, and some employers attempt to have a policy that that to catch all and meets all of them. It's hard because each state has little intricacies, like Montgomery. Every county has a different accrual total than the state of Maryland does. Little things like that. Or I think our definition of who's a family member is slightly different than theirs. So there's little ins and outs that make it really difficult to have a one size fits all policy. Um, so as more states pass laws like this, you, you employers will work around it um, and hopefully not by just erasing Maryland from their postings. I think as things evolve, so there's a, uh, it was a ban the box law that passed a couple of years ago. Um, as times have progressed, I think employers, smart employers are competing for labor and um, some of this were behind the curve on. So um, the ban the box law requires or prohibits Maryland employers from asking about a criminal background unless from some exemptions. A lot of employers stopped asking that anyway. Um, because you're 
you're getting rid of a potential labor source unnecessarily. And when everybody's competing for labor, you don't want to turn away people. I think that's coming with education requirements. I know here at the state, I've been trying to go through our job postings. And if it doesn't require for real a college degree, then we take it out of the, the what we call an MS-22. It's the job description. Um, and we've been trying to narrow down our job descriptions to just what really is necessary. Um, honestly, a lot of people are great employees that we currently have here that don't have college degrees. Some of our best employees don't have college degrees. My parents don't have college. My mom didn't even graduate from high school. Uh, she went to St. Catherine's School for Secretaries uh, and was a secretary at like 17. And um, she's, it's not a sign that she's not smart enough. She just went into the workforce early. Uh, so I think a lot of employers, it's a good a good prompt to go through your job descriptions. And if it's, if it is necessary for the job, like if you've got nurses that need to have a nursing degree, you're still allowed to do that, but it doesn't make sense to have a college degree requirement for salespeople at CarMax. Um, so it, it is a good prompt to go through and, and make sure that your job requirements really are necessary for the job. Uh, a lot of employers, I think use, uh, educational requirements as a, proxy for some other attribute that they're like, if I've got a college degree, that means I can stick through and work hard and dedicate myself to something for a certain number of years. It doesn't mean I, I know something. It just means I, I can stick with something and complete something. So maybe a college degree is a, is a proxy for some other quality. Well, if that's the quality you're looking for, figure out a better way to get that because there's plenty of people that probably have that that don't have a college degree and you're unnecessarily excluding them from your job applications and denying yourself potentially good hires. So hopefully employers kind of get there before we do. Uh, but I think none of the laws that are in front of Maryland, I shouldn't take none. Most of the laws are not something that the legislator here dreamt up out of thin air. It's something that another state might have already done, or some policy group has suggested it to multiple states. So we're not the only state that has this in the pipeline. Um, my guess is it's not going to pass this year because it's such a big change. Uh, but it'll come back year after year until probably it does. Um, come well, as an employer, we are, we have the trade off between years of experience and mm -hmm. degrees. But you know, and like I say, we're right here around the Beltway. But for those on other parts of the country that don't understand Maryland law, they just don't. Yeah, and question came practically, we wouldn't, um, we wouldn't slap them with hard fines on that. You tell them, you inform them, make them aware of the law, and let them come into compliance. Most of our laws, especially the complicated ones like the sick leave law, it's set up that our job is not to go run around and issue fines. Our job is to have people comply with the law. So. If you're in violation of it, you correct it and make it right and and move on. We're not, it, it, at least the sick leave law for the first encounter with us, it's meant to be a education of the employer and make sure they understand what they're supposed to do, not a chance for us to raise revenue for the state. So we issue fines for things. We don't get to keep any of it. Any fine we issue goes to the general fund. So there's no, like our, our safety fines, that we don't keep any of that. We're not funded by our, our findings. So we have we don't have an incentive to issue fines and citations because we're trying to get money. The goal is compliance with the laws. So if somebody's in violation of that uh, job posting requirement, at least our goal would be not to, to penalize them for it, at least initially, but make them aware of the law and have them fix it, come into compliance. Thank you. No problem. Matt, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, sure. uh, I have a couple, and then I also see, um, you know, a comment or a follow-up question from Tony in the chat. In your nursing example, would, would that employer be able to put that in the job requirements? It doesn't seem so. Um, I don't if know if you have any additional thoughts on that, and I also had a couple of questions. Yeah, if it's required for the occupational license or if it's an occupational requirement, yes, you could have it. So the bill is specific about it. I think if, if this bill does progress, it would probably get amended to be a little bit more specific about what jobs can and can't have the educational requirements. But you, if you're a doctor 
and you're hiring doctors, you need to have your doctor be a doctor. That's allowed. Uh, so it's there are exceptions for it when it's required. Okay, I had a question about a bill and a, and a sort of question of curiosity question. I asked a curiosity question first. Um, which Maryland industry has the largest number of motion fractions? I was just curious about that. Um, the, the obvious ones, construction and tree care. So mm. it's um, people that don't do fall protection. Fall protection is, it, it's the easy, obvious thing. A motion specter is, you can see that from the street. You're driving by, you look over and the guy's on a roof not tied off or a guy's doing siding work and isn't have the right equipment. Those are our, our primary ones. We, we've got one guy that probably does a couple hundred of those a year. And it's, it, it, it's almost amazing that he still manages to find employers that aren't doing it right. But you can go in any large construction site and find plenty of people that aren't doing fall protection correctly. And unfortunately, that's also one of the leading causes of injuries and fatalities in Maryland is falls, falls from height. We had uh, two in the last two weeks, um, guys falling off ladders. One died, one had to get both feet amputated this week uh, from falling off a ladder. So it's unfortunately a little too common. I had a boss who would always joke that, uh, I, maybe it wasn't a joke, that if you left a file drawer open in an office, that's a motion fraction. You gotta close all your file drawers uh, so it you don't be. run into them. Um, it, my, my last question, if it's okay, um, you, you may have touched on it already, but you know, another piece of pending legislation is the Family and Medical Leave Insurance Program. So that would be, uh, you know, if that bill passed, that would be administered by the Department of Labor. So um, I don't know if you had any comments. Uh, you know, I, are, I know that um, agencies submit, you know, letters of information and don't usually take positions on, on bills, but, you know, this is a big one. There's two of them right now. There's HB8 and I think... 496 is the other one. Um, so HB8 is mostly a refile of last year's bill that would, that one's a pretty broad law. Uh, I think it's 496. It's C.T. Wilson's bill. That one's basically a paid yeah. family medical leave law. So it's a lot less you could take it for. Um, it's It looks a lot like FMLA, but paid. That's probably, if any of them are going to have the chance of progressing that's at least a more reasonable one um i'm trying to think it would be 15 or more or 15 or less employees uh, the employee pays all the premium uh if it's more than 15 employees the employer and the employee split it uh it's pretty conservative on what you could take it for um but it it's there's up to 12 weeks of paid leave built into that law. Um, I think they're still working on the fiscal note for it. It would basically require the Department of Labor to make another unemployment division. So by law, the unemployment division can only enforce unemployment because it's federally paid or somewhat federally paid. So we would have to create a brand new division with 100, 150 employees minimum that it would take to enforce that. Um, at least the C.T. Wilson bill, I think it's a, it's a couple of days minimum you'd have to be off before you could apply. I don't think like the HB8, I think it's, you could apply for leave for like an hour or two. You don't even need to be a full day out of work to get reimbursed. So that would be a lot of claims. This C.T. Wilson one is a little bit more restrictive. So there would be a lot less claim traffic. So I think it's a smaller fiscal note with the size of the department, but you'd still need a computer database that somehow would handle that. And that is a huge undertaking. Um, I was on the family medical leave task force when this first came up six or seven years ago. Uh, and there's a bunch of other states that have done it. Um, so there are other examples out there that we can kind of look to and see what works and what doesn't work. Rhode Island's had one for a while and it's pretty conservative, pretty low premiums. And I think a lot of people in Rhode Island think it's a good law because it, it kind of works, but it's 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 not uh, miss a couple hours and get paid by the state. It's, it's meant to be basically a state paid short-term disability law, um, not a 
state paid sick leave type thing. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, you got California and Washington State, which are pretty much uh, paid leave for almost anything you can dream up. Um, and I think as of maybe a week or two ago, Washington State's already out of money with theirs because the premiums aren't enough to cover what was used. I think C.T. Wilson's bill is closer to Rhode Island than California. Um, so I think it would be it would be very challenging for employers because um, paid family medical leave is it means you're going to once it's paid, more people will use it than when it's unpaid. If you can't afford to take the time off, you you don't. So I think it would increase the trouble that employers have staffing these days. So. I think that's the main objection people are going to have is not the cost, it's the disruption to the employers. Thank you, Matt. No problem. Okay, and I don't see any other chat questions that are new. So um, I'm easily accessible. So my email address is my name, matt.helminiac at maryland.gov. If you ever have a question about sick leave or wage related stuff, um, we're always here. If you got most related questions, you can just pick up the phone and call the most office and somebody will answer your questions. It doesn't mean we run out and inspect you. So you can ask a question and it doesn't put you on the list of the places we go inspect. Um, so we're meant to help you comply with things. So, um, and Tiffany, yeah, Tiffany put my email address or she's getting ready to put my email address in the chat. Um, you can also always just call me. Um, my cell phone's 410-241-4777. Call anytime. I'll answer. And if I don't answer, I'll call you back. So you pay our salaries. So that's why we're here. So anytime you have something, let me know. Thank you so much, Matt. This is great. Not a problem. Thank Appreciate you very it. much. Thank you guys for your time. Thanks to everyone for joining us today as well. Brian, yeah. thanks for all your help as always. Joan, yeah, take thank care. Thank you, everyone. And and Thank you. thank you, Joan and Ann, for chairing this committee. And thank you, Matt and Tiffany, from the Department of Labor, a Commissioner of Labor Industry, to, uh, for joining us this morning. We really appreciate your time. Next meeting of the Economic Development Committee is March 2nd. Uh, be on the lookout for more information about that meeting. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, thank see you. Guys.